What's up guys? It is the best day of the week, Monday. <laughs> but with Team Chum Mondays, maybe we're making it a little bit better. Uh, we have Sam and myself. We're doing a, a live stream right now on Facebook Live. Uh, so if you're not involved and you, you didn't get on in time to ask questions with us, jump on the link. It's facebook.com slash bradleyhillgb slash live. Uh, jump on there every Monday uh, and then I put up the times in the the day before so it might be, sometimes it's 11 sometimes it's one it all depends on Sam's work schedule drop some comments in the comment section below uh, with some questions for next week's uh, topics and then we can go over them in the live stream next week as well and then you can get your questions answered uh, by us all right guys What's up guys? Welcome to Team Chill Mondays. Uh, we're getting started with our question and answers. We have some questions already from uh, Instagram, so we'll get started with those first while we're getting everybody else onto the stream. Uh, and again, we are recording this, so hopefully it should be up for replay on YouTube if you want to watch anything back or you didn't make it for the live stream. Um, right now, Sam. Hello, Melissa. Good to see you. Good morning. Morning, Melissa. We're yeah. just racing unicorns. Sam wants <laughs> to race there? unicorns. Waiting for everybody to come. So I am the purple unicorn. I am the pink unicorn. Place your bets now. Okay. Uh, where are we, what distance are we racing them? Maybe we should start here and go across. Yeah. From the line. From the line? Yeah. I'm not sure they'll go that far. Okay. But how do you... Yeah. Okay. In three, two, one. Yeah! <laughs> Smashed it! <laughs> you Mine went off towards the right. Look, you still going? Oh, oh, you go around the corner. Okay, you, you might need to go and pick those up. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're not going to get yours? <laughs> <laughs> no, yours is making the noise. Alright. Pink, pink, pink. Pink one. Yeah, Where, pink where did one. you get your unicorns from? I don't know, they, I think they were a Christmas present one year. Funny things. Uh, okay, so let's get started. We're gonna begin first. Oh, there's seven people on here. Oh. Feel free to say hello, guys, the <laughs> people that, away. <laughs> that are involved. Uh, <laughs> drop a little comment, say, hey, we're here, anything like that. Uh, so, <laughs> Good Sam morning! Right now, is playing around with her pink unicorn. Mm. <laughs> um, so we are going to get started with some Instagram stuff as I said it's also being recorded for replay on YouTube so if you're not already open up a second tab on your laptop right now go into YouTube and click subscribe on my channel and then you'll get all of the access to the, the vlogs the technique videos and now Team Show Monday's a little Q&A live stream Oh, we have dropped down to three. <laughs> <laughs> it was the unicorns. It was the unicorns. People don't want unicorns. No, bring back the unicorns. Oh, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why. Um, and now we're going to get into some questions that I asked over the weekend on Instagram. Uh, so again, if you go and follow us on all different uh, social media platforms. Sam, what is your Instagram? At Samantha Cook BJJ. At Samantha Cook BJJ and mine is at Uma Platter Man and the man that does Uma Platters. So let's get into some questions. I have not organised these. Uh, this is again an early Monday, early in sort of quarantine times. So let me ask a few questions. We're going to start off with some Sorry, just. Uh, social media does I don't know who else so, is in there. Right. Uh, we're going to start off with some like uh, theory questions first, then we'll get into some practical stuff later. So, Sam, we have a question. It says, I have stacks of confidence for competitions, but nerves beat me most of the time. Any advice with dealing with nerves? This is specifically aimed at me. I feel like I'm going to sneeze. It, it, it was. It's to, to both of us. Um, so me personally, things that help me to stay calm 
nervous uh, and calm my nerves before competition Sorry. are to have a excuse me I'm Sorry. talking <laughs> to have a, a focus of idea or the thing that I want to do first and try and focus my energies on that so that way I'm kind of occupying my mind um, with rather than thinking about all the eventualities that could happen in the match which used to happen to me quite a bit um, and that was after a time of having to get to the venue a few hours before just to familiarize myself with the uh, bathroom um, but the nerves get better the more you compete and sometimes people have expressed that they feel actually they compete so much that they get to the point where actually they don't really get nervous anymore and they don't get that excitement so nerves are good let's welcome them it's a feeling and we're trying to change that feeling of nervous energy into excitement you're excited to to fight you know have some faith and confidence that you you train regularly your body responds naturally because I think the worst thing for us is feeling that we're going to go out there and just lie like a pencil and do nothing your body is into that zone of reacting subconsciously you're not always thinking about the next move that you're going to go for that's what you do training for so you're not actually thinking necessarily about the uh, the possibilities you're just reacting so have some faith that your body will just react and you won't lie like a pencil. And if you do lie like a pencil, don't worry. It's not the end of the world. You can compete the next month somewhere else. So I think it's putting things in perspective a little bit. Have something to focus your energies on. Um, something that does help that I um, find is, is chewing or eating something before. So you kind of send the signals to the brain to suggest that I'm in a fight or flight response. But if I'm eating, I'm okay. So actually you're sending those kind of like reassuring signals. If you're chewing gum or something and you're starting that digestive system going, then your body says, okay, actually we can't be ready to fight right now because actually I'm eating. So everything's okay. Things like that can help. I, I think the, the talk on nerves being important is, is a good one. The, if you look at any documentary on wildlife or nature, you look at the the lions as they're about to catch their prey, they're walking towards it, the hair stands up on the back of the neck. So even lions and the, some of the greatest predators on earth have, uh, have nerves. So take advantage of that situation and it is good to, to have them. But again, as Sam says, uh, it's not the end of the world if anything does go wrong. So if you have something in your mind, like, a, like Sam said, a starting point, you want to know how you want to start the fight. Do you want to be on top or do you want to be on bottom? And if you're going to be on top, do you have a takedown? If you don't, <laughs> then you either need to think about pulling guard or you need to wait for your partner to pull and then you can begin passing from their guard pull, right? Otherwise, we get a little bit flustered in the match. This is where you have to, as soon as you, you shake hands and you hit that fist bump, everything will, will disappear. All those nerves will dissipate and then you're fine, you're ready to fight, right? You're just reacting to, the, to your opponent. Now, at the same time, you have to trust that you're doing the right thing and you have to trust in your habits. So if, if you, what you have been training over the last six weeks to prepare for this competition, if that's what you've been doing and you've been, I don't know, you've been passing clothes guard on your knees, if, but maybe that's what your training habit has been, then you have to trust in that. You can't then decide a, a coach that you've, you've not trained with for a while, but you recognize or your friend that trains in another gym is like, stand up, Barry, stand up. And you're like, no, I'm pretty sure I, I can pass from the knees. And <laughs> it, even if he's telling you the right things, you have to trust your own instincts. Because if, if you get triangled from that passing on the knees, which you probably will, then you know that you shouldn't have passed on your knees, right? If you stand up and you follow your friend's advice and you get swept and mounted, then you're like, oh, I shouldn't listen to John. He told me to stand up and I got swept and mounted. Next time, I'm going to pass on my knees. And then you get triangled. So you're just delaying uh, the process of learning for yourself. So just trust your own instincts and you, everything else will follow. If they go right, great. If they go wrong, you get triangle because you're passing on your knees. Then you go back and you say, oh, Professor, um, I've got triangle this weekend. How should I defend it? You said, well, Barry, you should probably stand up. <laughs> <laughs> and then you spend the next six weeks preparing for your next competition, standing up on your feet and passing the clothes guard, right? The, these are things that you learn over time. Okay. Long questions. Uh, long answers. Maybe we'll shorten them a little bit. Okay. What, what <laughs> would you like to win most in which order? 
I'm a JHF World, World Pro, and what is your top five of tournaments? You go first on that one. Mine, definitely, number one, and the only one that matters, the IBJGF Worlds. There's just a, something about the, the prestige that comes along with a, with a world championship a, in the gi. I mean, a, ADCC is definitely up there, and it's, it's second, but... There's... You should probably divide them into gi and no gi, I mm, think. Because no. the world no gi... Championships are not held in as high esteem as the World Gi Championships. The the Gi World Championships is literally the the pinnacle. Even though there, there's no, well, I, I think there's prize money now. Um, yeah, there is. But it, technically speaking, it's not financially as uh, impressive as the World Pro or ADCC. You can win a lot more money in those two tournaments. But if you're the IBJJF world champion, you are the creme de la creme. And, and that's what, what makes the difference. There's something about winning a tournament in a gi that it feels like you've got your suit on sort of thing. Where if you go winning in ADCC and just in a pair of shorts, it feels, <laughs> feels a bit relaxed, doesn't it? You know what I mean? I would rather. I don't know. I've never won ADCC. How I about would, you? Well, me neither. <laughs> but I would, I would prefer. If, if, if it came down to it and I was like. Okay, I, I could only win one tournament in my whole life. What would it be? World Championship, maybe. And then I would put ADCC, World Championships. Then I'd put the Europeans. A lot of people were like, oh, Pans or Noki Worlds, Europeans, baby. Gi Europeans as well. Because, uh, again, there's nothing quite like winning in the Europeans. I've been trying to win that tournament for, God, t 10 years now. And uh, go to the same <laughs> venue, flying to Lisbon the same time every year. It just it becomes very repetitive, but it's also your your home. If I if I'm being a European person, and again we can argue this being a European Union or something, but being a, a European person, I would love to win the European Championships. Uh, how about you? I mean, you, you already won it, so. <laughs> um... I don't know. I think as probably I get older, my priorities change. So, yes, it's amazing to go to California and compete in the World Championships, and that generally would still be the most incredible thing ever. Competing in ADCC was an incredible experience, absolutely, and I think you're very, you, you'll definitely create history if you medal in ADCC. Um, I don't know. For me now, it, it still always has to be Europeans and Lisbon because it's just. It's about everybody being there and everybody just taking over the city and it's a whole experience and we get to go and eat good food and like every corner that you go on you see somebody and then if you win the tournament like it you know that's just a kind of a bonus on top of it so maybe my kind of priorities have probably changed a little bit in terms of what I'm looking to achieve um, so yeah but probably similar really. Uh, okay, next next question. Who is the hardest person you fought, and also the hardest you've ever rolled with? <laughs> you want to go first? Male or female for me? Either. The hardest person I've ever fought. Well, I you've, don't you've know. only ever fought women, right? Yeah, yeah, but. But so. I train with, with guys. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so for you, just do a, a I don't really know, I've had some really good scraps. I guess it's how you define what's difficult. So if I get absolutely mauled by somebody, to me, it wasn't difficult. I didn't have any opportunity to do anything and I made a mistake from the get-go. Whereas the matches I think that are really exciting and probably, like, I get the most from are probably the ones that I had the most exchanges with. And I have a lot of exchanges and I have fought Tamara Silver quite a lot. And I find our matches are really close and they can be like, you know, a few discrepancies here and there, but we tend to go at it for the whole time. Um, and I really enjoy competing with her. Uh, again, because I think it's, I still have opportunity to do things and move and I can still advance into a good position and I can still come back from a bad position. To me, they're the hardest matches because they probably test the mental side a lot more than just the physical side. Not being a skater. Yeah, I mean, it was an, and it was an experience to compete against Bia Mosquito, and I would like to do that again. Um, I think it kind of surprised me that I swept her, and then I kind of just uh, paused, and then that's when it it went uh, wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was kind of like after the first, so the timer started. I was meant to pull guard. I pulled guard a little bit too late. I was too busy just staring at her face, like oh, <laughs> and then I pulled after she did, so she came up for two. 
and then I swept her, so I inverted and swept her, came up and then was like, okay, what now? There's uh, nine and a half minutes left. <laughs> and during that time of process of being a bit starstruck, she took a double trouser um, grip on me and uh, swept me. I had a really good fight actually in the World Pro one year as Brown Belt against Monique Elias. That was also a very close match. Um, a little bit frustrating, but um, that was good fun. I've had quite, quite a few matches with uh, Anna Carolina, which is always a pleasure. Uh, actually, that's, that's going to be one of my toughest matches. Um, yeah. Nice. Uh, while we're giving you all these uh, great stories, we've got uh, 16 people watching. Drop a comment, guys. Say hello to us when you jump in. Let, let us know that you're here. Because right now, we, we can see that people are watching, but we don't know who's who and what's what. So drop a comment. If you've got a question for us, drop it in there. If you just listen to some stories about who we fought, then, then stay in and do your thing. Uh, now, for me, it would probably be... For people that I fought between Izaki Bayange and Adam Vozinski. Adam, I've lost to probably eight times. I think we fought eight times and I've lost eight times. So that is still, like even though Izaki is a, is a world champion, I, I would probably still put Adam on the, on the top there. Just because of losing to him that many times. We've had some really good scraps and some really good matches and I tend to fare a little bit better in Nogi but it's uh, no matter what happens he is just an absolute animal. Um, but seeing him train at the World's Camp is a lot, lot nicer because uh, we went to Checkmate headquarters this year to prepare for the World Championships. Last year. Uh, last year. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting <laughs> to see how he does against the... Again, the creme de la creme too. So it's 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 uh, even though he's smashing you, he's also smashing other people. Uh, in terms of best people or toughest people that I've ever trained with, I have trained with people like Herbert Santos, and he's pretty tough. <laughs> um, but it it always comes down to the the three people: um, Victor, Braulio, and Roger. All for, for completely different oh, things. Oh, Roger's a hideous role. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, v Victor is the most explosive man on earth. Probably can fly and triangle you before warming up. Just like jumps and attack submissions from everywhere. So there's no pause. Braulio is a very much like, he just pins you in place while he's thinking about the next move and then he comes up with something creative and sometimes it gives you a little bit because he's playing around and it's, it's sometimes even worse because you know that he's giving it to you. Brown is like a vampire, this is the best way to describe him. Yeah. He'll give you like an inch and you kind of feel like, oh, I, maybe I could recover my guard here and then you get the life sucked out of you like and a then, vampire. And, Thanks, Brown, <laughs> and then Roger, it literally just makes you feel like a white belt. <laughs> it's a, like a, I've trained with some, and I've fought against some really good people. So I know my level is is sort of up there. But you train with Roger, and it literally you can't get anything going. You, you, he can let you put you in worm guard and get like the deepest wraps every, uh, wherever you are, and it's just like pin, pin, <laughs> mount. It's like, okay. And then there's a, uh, uh, uh. Yeah. There's actually a video of me getting squashed multiple times on his uh, yeah. Roger Gracie online. I just get <laughs> destroyed there. Um, Otavio Souza is another one. Oh, Molly's Hi, Molly. in the chat. It's took her three weeks to get here, but she is here. <laughs> She's finally found it. Okay, her. let's wrap up this. We waited okay. for that a lot. There's All a really right. good question here from Sebastian I would just like to oh, answer. Bueno. So, hi Sebastian, you said um, thoughts and opinions on the notion that if you start BJJ over the age of 18, you are over the hill and you will never be able to win international medals. Yeah. I started Jiu Jitsu at the age of 21 um, as a white belt, literally, um, and to date, um, a five times European champion, a world no-gi champion, a multiple Abu Dhabi Grand Slam champion. <laughs> so I would say ab that's absolute rubbish. Let's scrap this notion absolutely. And it's much more about um, finding what works for you and, uh, and training with the right people, really. So yeah, I didn't start young. Brad started really young. Um, I, yeah, I would... Uh, I think I'm living proof that you can start much later and still continue much later and still do well in international competitions. Any views on that? Uh, completely agree. 
Um, okay. Best way to smash the Baron Bolo. Nice. Come into that a few on this time. Let's let's get started. So when it comes to the Baron Bolo, you have to look at two main things. Is it starting from the double guard pull, or is it starting from the Della Hevo? And if you're already standing, you're on your feet, then you need to know that your hips are going to be brought towards the floor, right? So I need to prevent my hips going to the mat for my partner to get into his Baron Bolos. If we're already in a double guard pull, we're in a different scenario, then that comes into uh, leg entanglements. We're going to look from the Della Kiva, because that's probably the most common. So I'm probably wearing the wrong colour gear, I'm really sorry. Sam's just blending into the mat. <laughs> so, when it comes to the Della Kiva here, the first thing I do is I control this secondary leg. And see, a lot of people will clear this hook, and I, I will try to that, but a lot of people that are attacking the brown bowler will uh, make a go all the way around, grab onto the inside of your thigh. We'll go super deep on this leg, uh, grab onto your thigh here, all the way through there. You see, so they're cutting the corner already, so it's really difficult for me to then square my hips up and clear this hook to turn to face Sam. Uh, so a lot of times, what I'm going to be doing is controlling this leg over here. Now, my favorite thing to do is ninja roll. So I would uh, hit a duck under leg drag on this leg immediately. So I'll show you that first. And again, this isn't necessarily the, the first option. This is just my favorite. So I control over here. Sam might grab up onto my belt. She's trying to bring my hips to the floor. I'm posting on my back leg over here, taking a step. And then all I'm doing is pointing my knee in towards Sam's stomach, lifting this leg up and shooting my arm through. So I drop into position, my knee goes towards the stomach, and then I step out of the entanglement, completing that leg drag there. So now, this is a video, if you scroll through my Instagram, you'll see plenty of times. Uh, it's on, uh, I've done it gi and no gi, in a lot of different tournaments, here beautifully in the no gi pans. That's one of like my highest uh, grossing videos. But look, pop, back step, we're on a perpendicular line with my partner, but my knee is pointing inwards. So if we move Sam's leg out the way, we're off. <laughs> my knee is pointing inwards towards her stomach. I maintain that trouser grip. We lift it just a second, shoot through. Once I shoot through, all my weight is leaning onto this hamstring, and then I switch my hips to come into position, and I've landed in a perfect leg drag. Sometimes we might have to do a complete roll through if Sam's doing a good job of opening up that knee. Uh, and then we just roll over the shoulder. So we look to the opposite direction, roll through, make your hooks, and then roll back. So if we move down this way just a little bit. So again, I back step, I reach through. As I reach through, I roll and come back. Usually that's followed by a pause. So drop those emojis, drop those hand emojis in the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my absolute favorite way of defending the Berenbolo or again, just passing the Della Hiva. So that's one good option. There are loads more, um, probably more fundamental ideas of how to defend a Berenbolo, like maybe preventing the grips or straighten out your legs. But I'll show you the fancy stuff. Thank you for the clap, clap emerges. Everybody follow Melissa, clap emerges on that, on that ninja roll. <coughs> Thanks so much guys for the answer. Take that on board. You got it. Lovely. Right. Splendid. You, um, we're not, yes, Jamie Paxman in the chat. Hey Jamie. Paxi man. What's going on brother? No see. We're, we're not getting any questions. Ah, we, uh, we missed Gusto's question. Great to hear from you both. What's your favorite match that you have watched? Oh, as a spectator. Okay, okay. Favorite match you've watched? Thank you, Mateusz. Ninja Roll. Prozontko. Dobrze, dobrze. <laughs> okay, favorite match you've watched? I don't know. Let's come back to that one. Okay. Hmm. Favorite match? I always like watching the light women, like the featherweights and the light featherweights. Yeah. Because they're, they are like non stop for 10 minutes on IBJJF rules. They're generally, um, thank you so much, uh, really exciting to watch. That's an interesting one. Yeah. I, watching Bushesha in the finals of the World Championship every year is always impressive. Watching Bushesha get to the finals is literally on a knife edge. 
Yeah. There are split seconds where you think, he's not going to win. He's, like, he's lost it. He's going to be out. Oh, he made it. Yeah, yeah. But I think <laughs> Bracesha is at the level at this point where he's just playing with a lot of guys. So he likes to give them a, a point deficit first and then he starts trying to score points. <laughs> so he'll like get swept and passed and then he's like five nil down and then he'll just explode. And just to be from just bridge people off from bottom side control. And these are not small guys. They're they're probably heavier than he is. Uh, so it's always interesting watching him. There's obviously on YouTube I think best BJJ match is uh Bushesha versus Hodolfo. Uh, I got to watch that live and that was unbelievable. Especially when you have the two crowds playing off with each other. So it's it's uh, it's a spectacle to watch on YouTube, but it was unbelievable to watch live. Because you have the GF team guys and Hold off, Vieira, no para, no para. And then you've got the Boo Sha Sha, Boo Sha Sha. This unbelievable football like atmosphere uh, in the venue, which is unreal. So. Any of those matches are unbelievable. I would also just like to say on the flip side of that, white belt matches are some of the most exciting matches you could ever watch because they are just absolutely mental. And you, they end up in, people end up in positions, people, white belts are people too, I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but there are just things that happen that you're like, and it is it's it's generally I think very rewarding if like if you or if you have your own students or there's people that you're watching that are competing it at white belt that are just like you're winning you're doing great calm down they're still going they're still going and they're just like it's all right chill you've got this oh shit wait you're getting choked what just happened <laughs> they're some of the most exciting I think actually if you if you're bored at a tournament this is something that I do with my friends is I will coach people that I don't know you just start and the moment you start coaching somebody you get really invested in the match and that, that's that's a really fun thing to do especially white belts and especially if you're if your friend someone like Sean Coates is coaching your the other guy yeah, against yeah. you so you to coach people the that you know <laughs> that was quite ooh, fun to Kevin watch frustrated and then they start to open up these areas it's all game playing it's chess <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, one thing that you need to do here Bonnie is just have some fun so like I say with uh, with your specific training Hold on a second, let me just uh, get this camera back up and work. And it is frustrating, and also, just sorry, just to interrupt you there, Brad, I get very frustrated rolling with Brad. I've been training for over 10 years, and I still hate the fact that he's better than me, but I also, credit where credit's due. Um, and there are the mistakes that I make, but I also, he has to kind of check me a few times when he, I say like, oh yeah, but you're just using power and strength, and he's like, no, come on, like... If you use that excuse in your mind, then this is what's going to stop you, prevent you from progressing. And it's the same with everything, really. It's like, oh, it's just because this person is this way, or this person has really long legs, or what have you. But, um, yeah, oh, good, glad you enjoyed it. Um, but if you allow yourself to have those excuses enter into your mind, that you're never going to move beyond that point. Rather than being like, ah, oh, shit, man, I was going, sorry. <laughs> I made a mistake, what happened? Let's just rewind a little bit and have some fun. And then, obviously, in this situation, we are very limited with who we can train with because of Corona. But when we come back to training in the gym, just train with as many people as you can. Tall, long, short, you know, wide, skinny, whatever opportunities that you get. And then you'll start to build a very resilient guard that is quite, you know, generic for all and will become really, you know, indestructible. There you go. Uh, Holly Felton, we will get to your question. No, we missed it last week. Oh, yeah. So we'll get Sam to answer that uh, in just a second. Let's get to Patsy Man's questions. How do you uh, deal with for fighting the... smaller people when you're training your kids? Well, I'm it's not sure. Both of us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's get to Patsy Man's question on some crab rights. So, Jamie, one uh, really uh, good drill that I use is spinning from side to side on the crab ride. So um, I start off with the Berambola. I roll upside down, I place my hook back inside, and then you get into the crab ride position from uh, Berambolo, and then you'll switch your, uh, switch side to side. So let me show you real quick. I'm really sorry that I'm wearing black. I totally just didn't. Know. So you start off in your double guard pull, get to the ankle, grab onto the belt. Oh, we're going to have to move this one. Oh, okay. You okay. Gentle, so as me. you roll through, I take my top hook out to put behind the knee. Keep, keep your legs open. So, for me to then roll back. 
to maintain this position here. And if you notice the hook, I have a lot of downward pressure on the top of my knee, so I'm hooking with my uh, pinky toes, lifting Sam's shin up while my right knee is pointing down. And this is a really helpful drill just to maintain that flexion and you're literally lifting your, your little toe up. So I maintain the belt grip or I slide through to grab onto the waist and then I re-roll towards the other side. So I roll through and as I roll through I switch my hook towards the second leg. So I come into position, post up again and then repeat on the other side. So we're back to that same hook. My knee is going over the top of Sam's, my toes are raising her shin, I wrap through, roll, switch. I can't continue because of the space. Because of the but furniture. It, essentially, <laughs> this is the position you're landing in, right? So you, we're trying to keep these hooks. Now, one thing that I actually learned from the Meow Brothers, when you're uh, finishing your crab rides in terms of taking the back, you need to push, extend your legs, and push the guy's knees towards his face. So if we are getting underneath the person here, so again, I spin through, I get to my hooks. When I get to here, uh, okay. <laughs> you see my face? Okay. When I get to here, if I'm just bending my legs and trying to keep my hooks tight, I'm not gonna be able to take the back. I need to be attached to Sam and extending my legs. You see, I need to push her legs forward so that I can bring her hips inside of my lap so that then when I sit my hip to the floor, I can bring her in. You see? So you need that extension to be able to bring your hips towards the mat. And a lot of times I will uh, re-roll back towards the other side as well. So try the, the re-roll drill side to side, coming out and having that hook. Here. but again you're trying to create that flexibility where your heel raises like this while you maintain that hook and then you re-roll over the right shoulder make a, a second hook re-roll over the left shoulder um, and then the other part to it is extending the legs so let me do it one more time we'll go over Make the hooks, extend the legs, and then again, stay up, keep your hips up. Go back. I can't do that, but let me wait, wait. Oh! Woo! Roll through to the opposite direction for you to complete the back take. And then I'm into position to start feeding my feet in as though <laughs> they were hands. So that's a, a really helpful drill. Then at that point, then you start extending. Uh, your understanding from just the crab ride to twister hooks slash matrix type things and then putting power hooks in from a twister hook and then you really uh, start to expand your knowledge on the section from there do you kick the legs out when someone starts shuffling away too yes because you what you need to do is uh, you've got to keep the knees up towards the chest you have to elevate the hip so you've got to keep any any back take that's going under your partner you need to bring their hips up over the top of you. This is one of the common mistakes people make with like a power hook. I need to step on the floor with a power hook rather than put a place in my leg inside. So this is one example. I did this. Okay. <laughs> so imagine a basic, I'm putting you into position. Okay. Imagine a basic roll through. I have my legs intertwined. I roll through to get to the power hook scenario. Put my hooks on in. If I want to take Sam's back, I can't try to switch over here too soon because she will extend her legs and ultimately turn her hip in, right? What I need to do first of all is plant both my feet onto the floor to bring her, her butt and her hips on top of my chest. You see? Once I've stepped on the ground, you see? I step on the ground with the flat of my feet and I bend my knees towards me. Now I have the ability to pass into a power hook, you see? And I always go with a triangle so I close the triangle and then my top leg will hook on the inside of Sam's instep where now I can begin accessing the back. But when you're coming towards these positions, I need to bend and elevate the hip. So it's the same concept in the crab ride. If I'm here and Sam's hips start going away from me, I need to extend my legs. 
and roll through. So, so yeah, extend the legs away, and then if we lose them too much, then you start switching into uh, your power hooks and bringing them back. So one really good draw. Drop it back one more time. Please don't hurt. I won't hurt you. My foot got crushed against the sofa. <laughs> don't clap. <laughs> so, when we're upside down, if you're on the back here, Jamie, you start to lose it too much, take a trouser grip, catch underneath the second leg, so we switch into twister hooks, drop your hips down, and then extend up to bring the hip back towards you. To come back towards this position. So you bend and extend, and now I'm in a situation where I can place a power hook in over here. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, so yeah, when you get to the situation, if you start losing the hips too much, rather than retreating and coming straight into uh, a leg drag, come back to twist the hooks on just one ankle. So one hook in the knee line, one hook on the ankle, and then stretch upwards to bring the hips into position. <laughs> 